Hi, welcome to our podcast, Just One More Page, where it's never just one more page. Hi guys, welcome back to another episode. My name is Morgan. I'm Sam. And we totally did not record this episode (laughs) earlier. (laughs) This is not the second time this is happening. I can hear you slamming your hands against the desk. That was my phone going on the book. Oh, oh, okay. I was like, wow. I set my phone down on my book because I need to focus. This is us trying to recreate the magic of the first time. So the first time after we recorded it, my uh, computer decided to close the program down and delete the audio. And I was really sad. But even though I've already asked you this, Sam, how's your week going? (laughs) My week's going (laughs) okie-dokie. I've had the whole week off from work because apparently my inability to be graceful caught up to me and I sprained my foot, which sounds like the most ridiculous injury in the entire world. But because I stand on my feet for 12 hours a day, my doctor was like, you ain't working. And I wasn't fighting him. So he handed me a piece of paper. It was a get out of jail free card. And I have been living my best life. I read three books and I've just been hanging around and doing nothing. I wish that I could write a note to get out of work. I, you know what? Maybe if I write a fake doctor's note, I can be like, here, boss, here's my fake doctor's note. Please let me go. She probably would look at that and laugh and be like, get back to work. <laughs> Listen, I will show you a copy of my doctor's note. It's such a Word document. It would be so easy to just hand off. There's no signature on it or nothing. Oh, really? I don't think they they would care. They'd be like, nope, go back to work. Uh, but anyways, we got early access for this book by NetGalley and Poison Pen Press. The book that we're going to be discussing today is The Woman in the Library by, and I'm going to apologize if I say this name wrong. I did look it up, but I do have a speech impediment, so it's really hard for me to pronounce certain words, but I'm trying. I'm sorry, but it's by Slory Gentle, who is a writer of the Roland Sinclair Mysteries. Now, this is an adult mystery thriller that follows an overseas student named Freddie who is sitting in a Boston library when a scream erupts from the library and everyone kind of goes chaotic like the security guards are running around looking to see where the scream came from and they tell everyone to kind of stay seating and freddie like starts talking to her table mates and they immediately become friends and then suddenly she realized that one of them could be the murderer dun 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 yeah this was a really interesting book sam wasn't it I feel like we got catfished by this book because how the summary is set up is kind of like 12 Angry Men-esque. Like what I thought was everything was going to happen in one singular room or at least one singular setting the whole time. Who killed this woman and what was going on and that's not what we got at all. I think they spent all of like 20 minutes at the library at the very beginning and that was pretty much it after that they they were at freddie's apartment a lot and actually they pretty much stayed at freddie's apartment and then whatever restaurants they went to throughout the city of Boston. But that's about it. Like, it's not what I was expecting for sure. Yeah, no, I agree. I honestly thought that this would be more so like a Scooby-Doo kind of thing. Like, where I thought that they would be, like, locked in the library. And then they four people, like, they form a bond. And then they would have to, like, figure out who's killing people. And there's a murderer. And it's, like, thrilling. And honestly, I didn't get the thriller part of this novel. Like, yes, I guess, like, a mystery to figure out who did it. But I wanted more of a thriller. Like, I was really disappointed. And plus, like, this book is, like, 282 pages. This is not a big book by any means. Like, compared to the other books we've read on this podcast, it's not really big at all. And it honestly, it felt like a 600-page book. I kept zoning out. I kept fall- I fell asleep multiple times. And maybe that's because, like, I overwork a lot and was up really late reading. So that's probably why. But I kept falling asleep. It took a while for things to kind of happen. I didn't really like the writing style of this novel at all. I felt like at times the writing style was just a little bit off for me. I don't really know what it was. Because I I did, um, because the part of NetGalley, you have to, like, leave a feedback when you're done with the book and whatnot. So I had written at the top of my feedback, it was, like, mystery isn't really a genre like that I read specifically a lot of times it's like there's there's mysteries in almost all books otherwise you would never read you would know everything that was happening obviously there's a level of mystery but like when you're writing a book specifically in the mystery genre like I don't pick that up so this is my first ever like legitimate mystery section mystery book so I don't know if this is just how the writing style is is if this is a normal writing style 
I had a really, really hard time getting into this book. I think I restarted it two or three different times. And then we had the arc. I was reading it on the NetGalley app. I just couldn't read it. And I eventually just bought the book when it finally came out because for whatever reason, it was easier to get through holding the book than it was trying to do it on an e-reader because at least I could feel like I was making progress through it because it just it just felt so dragged out and I had a really h- rough time getting into the story. I actually ended up getting the audiobook. We were actually approved for the ebook, and I read a couple pages and I was like, I can't. Like, I literally cannot read it. Like, I don't know why like I just couldn't get into it so then I was like I'm gonna get the audiobook which thankfully we were approved for and I think another issue I had for this book is that there was a lot of subplots that were happening that we're gonna talk about later on but there was a lot of subplots to the point where it just I felt like it kind of took away from the whole story itself but if you have not read this book and you'd like to read this book please go buy it or buy the audiobook or buy the ebook and go read it and come back because right now we're going to be going into the spoilers part of the podcast also if you don't want to listen to it we do have other episodes that are non-spoilery we have a podcast in which we talk about audiobooks versus physical books versus ebooks and then we also have this tropes episode that's really really fun so go check those out Anyways, we're going to be talking about this book in more detail. And the cool thing about this book, at the end, they actually have questions that they ask. And we decided that we're just going to answer some of the questions. There was about like 10, but we decided just to answer about four of them and kind of give you our answers. The first question, Sam, when Freddie, Wit, Kane, and Marigold, by the way, I love that name Marigold. I don't know why, I just love it. But when they get coffee together for the first time, Freddie mentions that it was the start of her friendship with a killer. Who did you suspect in that moment? So I suspected Marigold because she was just odd. Like there's odd, quirky, but then there's just odd. And she just didn't sit right with me. Something about like how she was acting around them. Instead of being a part of the group, she was almost like inserting herself into the group, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It was just strange. We read further on we find out that she was actually stalking wit so my original feelings were correct in that she's very strange and she is inserting herself ultimately she wasn't the killer but she was my like first pick and just like i don't know weird vibes the whole time i just didn't have good vibes off of her yeah i could kind of see marigold being kind of like shady you know she was super overly happy but i honestly thought that it was wit because in my mind i was like okay kane seems like the love interest like he's like the bad boy you know (laughs) and also i don't know why when i said bad boy i picked you're gonna laugh at me i picture i think his name is steven Strait. i picture him from the convent oh covenant yeah the covenant covenant yeah i picture him his character (laughs) for some reason i assumed that you would think it was him but in reality it wasn't him and then for marigold i didn't really get that vibe from her like i felt like wit was going to be like your typical frat boy with blonde hair and blue eyes and bright teeth and i was like (laughs) it has to be you she's writing a novel and she's trying to come up with characters and so she calls each character a different name like she calls kane handsome boy wit heroic heroic i can't say that word sam and then she calls i forgot what she calls marigold freud girl like freudian complex like she's got some mental issues well that is true very true So I was like, okay, she's kind of calling Wit a hero in some ways. So that makes sense that he would not be him. And I was like, it's going to be you. It's going to be me. As soon as I said that, I was like, I'm not going to sing that because that's going to be annoying. (laughs) And as soon as I thought that, you started singing it. (laughs) Okay, so question number two. Thanks to emails, we are regularly reminded that Freddy's story is fiction. Did that change your experience of the mystery at all? Yes. 100%. I feel like with most books, you you find a flow in the story. Like when you start reading and you start getting to know the characters and getting to know kind of the space they're living in and kind of the rules of the story, you start flowing with it and you're like, yeah, I I enjoy this and I'm ready to go to the next page because I want to know what happens next. And then it's just like, bam, email. Like it breaks your suspension of reality altogether. I don't feel like the emails added to the story like i don't feel like they actually served any kind of purpose instead of like a subplot it was like a side plot like it was just something going on in the book at the same time that the book was being written and it really messed with my head a little bit so the emails 
our emails from a beta reader to the writer who's writing Freddy's story and Freddy in the story is writing a story about the characters and story so it's a story within a story within a story my head hurts Sam my head hurts okay yes storyception like I felt like I was reading two different novels at the same time Leo's emails who is obviously the beta reader whose real name is actually Will like obviously in the beginning you're like oh you think that he's just a friend you're like oh he's probably just a friend like it's not a big deal but then like you, he starts to get really crazy i don't like it i said it before to you in the episode that we filmed that got deleted that his first ever murder mm-hmm. victim was the publisher i want to look back and see the rest of his emails because i feel like slowly you're gonna realize how creepy it was because in the beginning you just feel like he really good friends with this writer named hannah and they get along and then it slowly just gets more creepier and creepier and actually like i felt myself more excited to read the emails than actually to read the actual novel because i feel like it'd be more interesting to read a story about a beta reader becoming a serial killer and then slowly going after the writer. Like, I felt like I was reading two different books at once. And I, I don't know, I just, I didn't like it and I didn't enjoy it and I didn't like it. I, was like, I found it super interesting too that in the beginning, if you really read the emails and you take the suggestions and everything that he was given Hannah, because I think that was the name of the author inside the book was Hannah, she was taking his suggestions. Like, he would be like, well, this is what Americans actually say or maybe you should adjust this or place this person here or how are you going to do this? And like, and they sound like legitimate, real good suggestions for her writing. And she, so she starts putting them in but like as the emails get more and more psychotic and once you get past that like fbi notice like she stops putting things in the story like it's leo will so mad and you could just see how his like emails start to change and you could just see the crazy coming out of him and uh, again like you said i would have much rather read that story than the story we were actually reading exactly actually there's a part i want to talk about will talk or leo he talks a lot about like like stuff that's happening in real life like the wildfires in australia covid and then like he gets like really intense because he's like right about covid put instead of putting on hoodies put on masks and i'm like what is happening calm down sir calm down calm down take a chill pill Like, he was freaking Mm -hmm. out. It would have been a more interesting novel if that was the focus. Another thing that was really crazy in this book is, do you think the other characters took Marigold's stalking behavior seriously? What would you do if your friend was acting like Marigold? So, I don't feel like they took it as seriously as they should have. And even Wit calls it foreplay at one point. He's like, oh, it's just something she does. I think Freddy tries to deter her just a small bit for like a minute. But nobody really tries to like stop her from doing it. There's like one or two times where they're like, oh, what a coincidence that she's in the same spot as us. But then after a while, it's like maybe it's a little less of a coincidence that she's in the same spot as us. And her constantly calling Freddy and then getting mad when Freddy doesn't pick up and then just showing up at her house and stuff. This is why I thought it was Marigold at first because I was like, someone's a psycho. And, and as far as like, what would I do if it was my friend? It, depending on the level of friendship, but just in general, I would just be like, hey, if, if you want to catch a charge, this is how you catch a charge. So don't go catching charges. Like you need to stop because you're kind of acting a little out there yeah i think that they did not take it seriously at all and if the roles were switched and if it was one of the male characters they would be like oh my god that's so wrong but because she's a female they're just like oh she's in love but in reality i'm like you're a stalker you're creepy no i also kind of felt like they push her and wit together especially freddie freddie was like oh here's a dress to wear to your date and like she's just she's like one steps away from like smashing up your windshield and then trying to like sneak into your house to like i don't know cuddle in bed with you or something like creepy and for a friend i think that depending on how the friend is i feel like i would want to talk to them although i did have a situation before where my ex-friend her boyfriend broke up with her and she waited in her car for three days outside his house don't don't do that don't be a stalker i i definitely think they completely ignored it and they should have they should have been talked about it also was a weird thing of like why are you adding this into the story kind of thing i don't know i just felt really weird the last question we have is caroline and wit planned to test whether they could gain Kane back into a life of crime if they had executed their plan as originally intended what would you think would have happened what does their experiment reflect about our attitudes towards convicted criminals 
I honestly don't feel like Kane would have tried to commit crime post his one, like, indiscretion. I say indiscretion. He killed his stepfather. But I don't feel like they would have been able to be successful in trying to, like, get him to continue a life of crime now that he's out of it. And it sounds like his, like, previous book was kind of therapeutic for him. Getting all of his emotions out and everything because everybody kept telling them how how raw it is and how eye-opening it is. But I, I feel like, too, that because they felt like they could could get him to repeat offending. I, I'm using a very royal we that we feel like once a criminal, always a criminal, and it would be super easy to just make them start committing crime again. I would say, however, that if they were able to be successful in that, that they would be considered accomplices to whatever he did because they were the ones who were triggering the the chain of events to lead up to whatever Kane ultimately ends up doing if they were successful in their plot to make him commit more crime. And it's just sick and twisted. Who, what kind of human being sits down and goes, "We're going to write an article about this like previously convicted felon who." went into jail when he was 15 years old and we're gonna go see if he's gonna do something else again how messed up do you have to be in the head to think that say privileged rich Mm -hmm. people because yes he did kill his stepfather and you know there's obviously two different points of view to it there's the lawyer's point of view of what happened and his point of view his point of view is that his stepfather beats him he ran away he got talked to go back after two weeks and then his stepfather tried to sexually assault him and he had a knife on him under his bed which is something that his mentor taught him like his per- the person who took care of him when he was homeless and he stabbed his stepfather now according to the lawyer uh, his stepfather was like very important like chief yeah he was a decorated police officer and too hard that's like you're guilty even now you don't even really know the truth because we, we're not really in Kane's point of view mm. but I, I definitely think that if they were able to get test him I don't think anything would have happened because I don't I feel like if anything they probably would have just got him in trouble but I mean I don't know how Caroline was but I definitely think that wit is not s- smart like I feel like it would have been panic it would have been chaoticness But that being said, I think it's harder if you're a convicted criminal in the United States because it's harder to get jobs and that usually leads to people doing things for money and then ends up for them to be in jail, which is really sad. Do you want to go into our overall thoughts or is there anything else you would like to add? Yeah, let's go into our overall thoughts because I could probably go on a tangent for like six hours about the criminal justice system. Overall, I thought this was a really interesting story. It was full of romance which was really interesting even though i wanted more of a thriller there was a little bit of mystery and a ton of side plots that being said it was really hard for me to get into the book i felt myself wanting to hear more from leo and his letters than the actual story and even though we do spend time with the characters i felt myself not being attached to them at all like like i said i want a scooby-doo kind of mystery gang solving stuff but instead we just got them in the library for one scene and that was it so i wasn't a huge fan of it i rated it three stars i don't know i wanted to like it because i've seen so many people love this book and maybe it's because like i'm not a mystery reader but for me personally i just i didn't like it so i said i was spending most of the book leaning into marigold being the killer because she was just odd i feel like kane was too obvious of a choice because the email leo was so obsessed with kane being the killer it just felt too easy as the book went on and wit was in the hospital i felt like the reason that the author was pulling a lot of the focus off of him was to create a bigger plot twist at the end that was why he was in the hospital for a good part of the book and it became more plausible for it to be wit honestly i was hoping the author hannah would become unalived and we would have to guess who the killer was like the book never completed and we have to make our assumptions that would have made for a super interesting plot device oh wait hold on real quick before we end this okay i didn't like how the book ended by the way because of course we have the letters in which we find out that leo aka will was sent to prison and he's like i can't wait till i get out and meet you which is which is creepy but at the end of the actual book is her going be in the hospital yeah and then all of a sudden leo from the book shows up is leo from the book supposed to be evil i don't get the ending either you know what if if the hannah author was killed at the end of this book before the book was completed I feel like the emails would have made more sense. Oh, yeah. It would have made a lot more sense. 
and then it would have left it up to the reader to try and guess who the killer was. If Okay, so that scene ends where the last scene is of her turn around and she sees Leo, who was a character written in the book. And Leo's like, I am here because I thought you needed me. And then next article was like, here is like a obituary of Hannah who died. That would have been really good. But instead I'm like, why did it end this way? I don't understand. But next week we are going to be reading this really interesting book called We All Fall Down by Rose Sausable. So they are known for writing the books What Big Teeth. This book follows actually four young queer people who are struggling with day-to-day life not realizing that they have been chosen to awaken the magic in their world. But When a death rocks their fragile peace, they are brought together to uncover a magical conspiracy. So we're going to be reading that next week. I'm really excited about it. It seems like it's going to be a really fun fantasy read. And yeah, I'm excited. So we thank you guys for listening to this episode. If you guys are curious, we have a TikTok called Just One More Page. And we also have an Instagram called Just One More Page Official. And anything else, Sam? If you are listening on Spotify, please give us a five-star rating. Because the more we get rated, the higher we get pushed up into the ranks of people being able to find us and come and listen to us. And if you're listening on Apple, again, please give us a five-star review. Follow us because you'll get notifications every time we post a new podcast, which is every single Sunday. Thank you for listening to this episode. We will see you guys next week. We hope you have a great, sunny, amazing Sunday. Bye. Bye.